attention accounting finance accounts payable and payment professionals join us for a quick guide on conquering automation and accounts payable there's quite a bit of accounts payable automation also referred to sometimes as ap automation solutions available today this is closely related to invoice automation and sometimes the line between these blurs regardless of the solution selected you will need to have a good understanding of invoice processing and automation if you are going to do an effective job of accounts payable management. Let's start off by taking a look at the difference between AP automation and invoice automation. So we started off with invoice automation, which was exactly what it sounded like, automating the, the processing of an invoice. Then we had accounts payable automation, and that typically included the whole piece, not only the invoice processing, but the payment piece as well, and sometimes, but not always, the master vendor file. So it's not clear. And now we have these vendor portals, which to be honest, a lot of the supplier community is not happy about because they have to kind of deliver their own invoices. These portals are self-service, which is a great joy, if you will, to the accounts payable side of things, but on the AR side, not so important. So a whole bunch of different products uh, going after the same market, all of which have different components. And you can't just assume because something says invoice automation or accounts payable automation that you know what it is. So all these different titles for products that are similar, but not necessarily the same. So when you go forward, regardless of what the solution provider is calling the solution, you need to make sure you understand exactly what's included, what processes are included, what you're still going to have to do manually. And that way you'll be comparing apples and apples and you'll be getting the same functionality. There's no generic model, unfortunately. Now, I promised you the one thing that I wanted to make you aware of before we moved on. If you're getting one of these end-to-end -end solutions, which is fine. A lot of them are really nifty. Make sure that you ask the solution provider whether or not all payment options are included or they push the vendors to accept card payments. Because if card payments are the preferred solution and there's a big push towards it, you may find that you have some very unhappy suppliers. And of course, that's not the outcome that you were hoping for. So just focus on, yes, it includes the payment piece and does it include checks, ACH, wire transfers, whatever you're interested in, or is it simply just a card solution? Before we delve into the topic too deeply, I'd like to take a minute and discuss AI technology and its role in automation. I promise this will be really brief and not technical at all. As most of you are aware, AI stands for artificial intelligence. That's great, you say, but what does that mean when it comes to accounts payable, accounting, finance, etc.? Basically, it is the science of making machines that can think like humans, but not just for very basic tasks, for processes that are more complicated, in other words, it could two things that are considered smart. The biggest application we've seen is in the accounts payable space is in the processing of invoices. A smart automation solution can read invoices that were either submitted through a portal, sent by email, or scanned from paper, and figure out who to forward it to for approvals. Once the invoice has been approved, it can then complete the three-way match, that is the automation solution, and if everything is verified, schedule the item, the invoice for payment. It does this using a set of rules that have been pre-established. Clearly, if these rules change, then the model needs humans to go in and adjust it, at least for now. That is a very, very basic explanation of how we are using AI in one accounts payable function. The next big advance with regards to AI and finance and accounting and accounts payable relates to analytics. AI technology can also process and analyze large amounts of data in ways that humans just can't. Part of this is due to the huge drop in the cost of processing capacity. Um, also, AI is able to recognize patterns and trends that we, not be, we might not be able to see with the human eye or calcul calculate in an Excel spreadsheet. That's right, it can analyze more data than you can fit in an Excel spreadsheet. This could be a real game changer for some organizations. Have I got you interested? Do you want to learn a little bit more? So let's say you're ready to get started. There's a plethora of products and you need to pick one and some of them have some really nifty features, stuff folks would love to have. Alas, if your organization is like the ones I've worked for, 
you probably don't have an unlimited budget. So it will be necessary to sift through and decide what are your must-have features and which are the nice-to-haves or the like you'd like to have, but the ones you can probably live without. And of course, there will be some you just... Let's take a look at the features I strongly believe you must have and the ones that would be nice to have. If you don't have an organized plan, shopping for an accounts payable automation solution or invoice solution or any automation solution for that matter can get quite confusing. So keep track of your requirements and who has what in either a Google Sheet or an Excel spreadsheet. This could mean the difference between a successful digital transformation and a flop. We've broken down the features you should be looking at into two groups, the must-haves and the nice-to-haves. Depending on your requirements, you may move some of the features between the two categories. Make sure you stick around until the end when we discuss the one issue few ever think about until they're sitting there with a nightmare on their hand. Now, as we go through this list, at certain points, you'll be likely to think to yourself, the salesman from the automation solution provider is never going to answer that question honestly. And you will be right. That's why I strongly recommend if you can possibly find someone using the solution, you talk to them on your own. Sadly, this won't be the references provided by the automation solution provider, so as they are likely to only share those of folks who've had a positive experience with them. You need to find them on your own possibly by posting on LinkedIn or at an industry meeting. Let's get started with the must-have features. Must-have feature number one. Let's get the elephant in the room right out of the way up front. You want to get pricing that fits your budget. Now, to be fair, even though I hate to have to do that, your budget will determine how many of the following items you can realistically expect to get. No one goes shopping for a brand new Rolls Royce expecting to spend $20,000 or 20,000 euros. So keep this in mind. Must have feature number two, the ability to directly read the invoice that has been emailed in without any human inter interaction. In my humble opinion, this will become a standard feature, at least in the United States in the future. For without it, suppliers will continue to drag their feet at the thought of having to change their ways and utilization of your new automation solution will never be what you hoped for. The reason I stipulated the United States is that many other parts of the world, a good portion of Europe, Asia, South America, etc., electronic invoicing mandates are becoming the norm and PDFs of invoices do not meet that definition of an invoice permittable, permittable under those protocols. But in the United States, we are nowhere near to even discussing such actions. And by the way, neither are they in the UK, but some UK representatives have been attending some of these meetings, so they're closer than we are. Must have, must have feature number three, any solution that doesn't require your suppliers to change much or ideally at all will end up with a higher utilization than a solution that requires a change. That is because unless you are the 800 pound gorilla in the relationship with your vendors, your vendors are not going to change for you. This is why I've made such a big deal about the ability to read invoices from emails. For with this feature, your suppliers don't even have to know that you automated your invoice processing or your accounts payable function. As long as they are emailing invoices, and most of them are, they don't have to know about the change. And before you start thinking, well, we're Microsoft or Amazon or whoever, and we're the 800 pound gorilla in all our relationships, realize that no one is the 800 pound gorilla with the utilities. They don't discriminate. You do, their, you do things their way. Must have feature number four. Now I'm gonna be honest here. I thought originally supplier self onboarding was a dream come true for the accounts payable space. And it was for the accounts payable space, but that's it. With suppliers entering their own information into the master vendor file, password protected of course, accounts payable teams would no longer have to worry about those awful, phony, change my bank account emails. Plus, as an added benefit, it took away some of the tedious data entry work that your accounts payable team had to, had to do. So what more could you want? Well, what I had not done when considering this is walked a mile in your supplier's shoes. All it took was for me to give a talk at a credit and receivables conference advocating for the use of what I saw as these wonderful portals and one furious receivables manager screaming at me 
We have 6,000 customers. Do you really expect me to have someone go in and update every single one of those vendor portals every time we make a little change? All of a sudden, I could see it from her point of view. And that was even before she started unloaded on, loading on me about taking on her customers' accounts payable work. So on my must-have feature list, I now include do not require, does not require suppliers to self-onboard. The supplier community hates this requirement, often refusing to do it, resulting in you having lower utilization of your automation solution. And you didn't pour all that work and effort in to have your suppliers not use it. Must have feature number five, scalability. Ideally, you want to purchase an automation solution that will work forever, regardless of how big or fast your organization grows. Of course, if your organization grows exponentially, they may be willing to spend a little bit more on the solution and you'll be able to get one of those that has some of the fancy bells and whistles that I'm going to talk about at the end of this session. And there are quite a few of them, by the way. But that is not your consideration today. At this point, you want to find a solution that will not only accommodate you today, but will work if your organization grows quickly or acquires another company and then you have to handle their accounts payable responsibilities. Must have feature number six. Good documentation that the service provider regularly updates with any and all changes. Otherwise, like your accounts payable policy and procedures manual, if it is not updated, it is not worth the paper it's printed on, or in today's world, the space it takes up in the interspace, or whatever you want to call it. Again, if you ask the automation solution provider, they're not going to say something like, oh no, we don't update our documentation, we hate to do that, we always have a hard time finding someone to do it. This is one of those areas where you're not going to get an honest answer if the documentation isn't being updated on a regular basis. And that is why insights from someone you find on your own who is using the same solution will be worth its weight in gold. Must have feature number seven, simple integration with your ERP, whatever it may be. If you need a good deal of IT support, this is likely to stall your project. Are you apt to get an honest answer from the service provider when you ask if integration is apt to be anything less than smooth? Probably not. There's a good chance you won't. This is where talking with someone you found on your own who has used the solution will come in handy. Also realize that the interface for certain ERPs may be better than others. So if you're talking to someone who has a different ERP system, then their experience may be different than what you have. Must have feature number eight. The solution should be as user friendly as possible so it won't require massive staff training to use for either you or your staff or your suppliers. Don't forget your suppliers. You can probably judge this yourself if they let you do a test run. You can do this or better yet, have someone on your staff do it. That person should be representative of the individuals likely to use the solution on a day to day basis. They will ask questions about the operational details that you might not think of. Must have feature number nine. There should be solution provider support for both your team and your suppliers. You don't want your suppliers calling you every single time they have a problem as you are not, as you are likely not to have the answer and you're just going to have to call the solution provider yourself to get them the answer they need. So this is one area where not all providers have robust support and you want to ferret that out up front. And if your suppliers can't use the solution or they run into a problem, they simply won't use it. And of course, that's not what you want. But if they can email you the invoice and completely sidestep and not have to interact with the solution, you won't have this problem. So remember what we discussed earlier. Must have feature number 10. Automatic update anytime there is an ERP update. This probably should be at the top of your list. As you know, ERPs update whenever they feel the need and you have no control over it, especially if it's a security issue. The automation solutions provider should make whatever adjustments are needed to accommodate the, idea, the update. And in an ideal world, this would be transparent to both you and, their, and your vendors. This should be discussed upfront, especially if you are using an ERP that not many of their other customers are using. So ask how many others 
with the same ERP as you are using their solution. They should be able to give you that information, by the way. They don't have to tell you who they are, although it would be nice if they would, but they should be able to tell you how many. Must have feature number 11. Clearly, if they are reading invoices using OCR, you want to have a high accuracy level as you don't want to constantly have to rekey information. The solution provider will share some stats, but verify this with your references. And now, on to the nice to have features. Nice to have feature number one, alerts for potential duplicate payments. Ideally, no second copies of invoices make it through to the point of being scheduled for payment. But if you've been operating for any amount of time in the accounts payable space, you know that we don't live in that dream world and occasionally an invoice still manages to slip through. Being alerted for potential duplicates is a really nice but not necessary feature to have. Nice to have feature number two, robust reporting. Needs in this area will vary to, from organization to organization and will depend on what you can easily get from your ERP. Some of them are robust in that area, some of them aren't. But if you prepare a list of reports that you'd like to have ahead of time, you can see what the automation solutions offer and what the different ones also offer. Also, ask about how easy or difficult it is to create special reports as needed by various teams. And if you can play around with the system, you can even try and do that. Nice to have feature number three. The ability to read handwritten documents is a nice feature if, and this is a big if, you still get handwritten invoices. My guess is only a few of you do get them, but if you do, ask about it. Again, it is a nice to have and probably only something to consider if you're getting more than the occasional handwritten invoices. I know some organizations just simply refuse to accept them. They have to be typed or computer generated. Nice to have feature number four, uh, having others in your industry already using this solution. If many are using it, the provider may have developed some reports and routines that you need and are unique to your industry. So when researching, when searching, ask providers if others are in your industry are using it. But don't rely on them to figure out what your industry is, okay? Because some of them will get it right, some of them will get it wrong, they'll guess, who knows what they'll do. Um, so you want to tell them what it is. Now, you've probably figured out from what I'm saying that your ideal reference would be from someone who is facing the same issues as you are and are in the same industry. But that's, you know, an ideal. Nice to have feature number four, uh, feature number five, some level of fraud detection. Now, you should never rely 100% on the solution provider to protect you against fraud. But some features are nice. This, sadly, is something where we all need to be alert as criminals are masters at finding ways around even the best of technology. This is why I like to say, when it comes to fraud protection, it takes a village. Nice to have feature number six, dispute resolution models. They're nice to have as they make resolving discrepancies between the invoice, the purchase order, and the receiving document easier to resolve, but these models are not perfect and they only work if both parties use them. That's why this is on the nice to have list and not the must have list. Nice to have feature number seven, portals where your suppliers can go and check their payment status so they are not continually annoying your staff with calls like, did you get my invoice? When am I gonna be paid? Did you schedule my invoice for payment, etc." If you have this portal, you can then very nicely point them to the portal so they can check instead of constantly interrupting your accounts payable staff with their questions. They can check every day. They can check to their heart's content. You don't care. Of course, if they don't see their invoices scheduled for payment, you're still going to get those calls. Nice to have feature number eight. When the solution is updated, it won't require massive changes on your part. This is where your references really come in handy, especially if you can find someone on your own and not, are not relying on the references provided by the provider. One of the most heartbreaking issues for companies to face is having spent a lot of time, effort, and money on acquiring and setting up a new automation solution and then having low utilization, either because suppliers or employees walk at using it. A little advanced planning will help you avoid this nightmare. Do you agree with my assessment? What would you do differently? Let us know in the comments. I'm really interested to hear what you would think. Before we get to the reasons some automation projects either fail or end up with very low utilization, 
I'd like to share three key automation mistakes. You can prepare adequately and avoid making those mistakes in your own project. Mistake number one, creating more work for your suppliers. If you select a solution that will create more work for your suppliers, you're almost guaranteed that they're not going to participate in great numbers. And I've got to admit, I'm one of the biggest culprits of advocating for this at least a few years ago. Some of you may remember the self-service master vendor files that were either standalone products or part of an invoice automation solution. And while if you look at it from the accounts payable standpoint, it's great. It helps with the change my bank account fraud. It also reduces the work in accounts payable and it helps with a lot of other things. It created a lot more work for the suppliers out there and they really were not happy about it. And this accounted for a lot of lack of use of some of the automation solutions. So when you're selecting a new solution, do not select one that's going to create more work for your suppliers because for the most part, they're just not going to do it, okay? So that's mistake number one. Mistake number two, not making it easy for your suppliers to participate. Anything that they have to do that's out of the ordinary, they probably won't do, or a good number of them won't do. So if it's going to require special training, a lot of them aren't going to do it. If instead of emailing the invoice, they have to you know, go to your portal and deliver the invoice or deliver the information, a large number of them aren't going to do it. So if you've heard me talk about automation in the last, oh, I don't know, six months or so, you probably know that I'm a big advocate of selecting a solution that has the ability to read the invoice from email so that if one of your suppliers emails you an invoice, it can automatically be read. Okay. And I even think going forward that if the solution doesn't have this facility or capability, if you will, that you're setting yourself up for failure. So make it easy for your suppliers. And this also means, by the way, selecting a solution that's user-friendly, that's kind of intuitive. Because remember, it's unlikely that they're all going to go for that special training that you'd love to have them take part in. Now, you can probably make your employees do it, but you don't have the same power over most of your suppliers. Maybe a few, but not most. Okay, mistake them. number three, charging for the privilege. And if you're just listening to this, I'm making quote signs in the air. Charging for the privilege of using the new service. Hopefully no one is doing this anymore. Charging your suppliers to use, for example, your automation solution. But I know there are a few out there that are. Like I say, we were contacted, oh, two or three weeks ago about someone we do business, not with an invoice automation solution. Let me make that clear. But they had another solution that they wanted to charge everybody to use. And they made it real clear it was a non-refundable charge. And I thought, oh, <laughs> this isn't going to fly. Okay. So what am I talking in the invoice automation world? Going back a little bit in time when these solutions first came out, there were some solutions that the vendors had come up with what I call the brilliant idea, that it would cost nothing to implement because what the company that was making the purchase would do is they would charge each supplier $5 in invoice for every invoice that they submitted. Now, first of all, this aggravated the living daylights out of the suppliers, despite the fact that the company that produced the product, and there were several of them, were saying, oh, your suppliers will be happy to pay for this. No, they won't. So they're aggravated that they have to pay for it in order to invoice you. So you bought something from them. And now in order to get paid, they have to pay you so they can submit their invoice. That's number one. And number two, going back to make it easy for them, they now have to figure out how they're going to account for this, how they're going to get this lousy $5 on their book. So hopefully you're not charging for using of any of these things because a it's not fair and it's just going to aggravate the living daylights out of your suppliers and your vendors so there are many reasons why automation projects fail and many of them are simple enough to fix like some of the ones we've discussed yet if you are getting value from this talk please consider hitting the thumbs up or like button it lets me know i should make more content like this and youtube know that it should share it with folks just like you. Now, let's look at nine reasons why automation projects fail. That way, you can make sure to address them before they get a chance to torpedo your project, possibly your career along with it. One of the dirty little secrets in the world is the fact that many AP or invoice automation projects fail to deliver. And all these reasons, by the way, are related to your vendors. And what we're seeing, what has evolved over the last few years, 
is vendors don't always participate, okay? And when they don't participate, or even if they do participate, they complain. There's a lot of things that they don't like about these projects. So let's dive into them. And maybe by understanding what they are, you can help address them. So like all people, or like many people, your vendors don't like to change. And so when they go from, you know, sending you an invoice to now they have to maybe enter information into a portal or do something different into your portal, et cetera, they don't like it. They complain. There's lots of complaints in the vendor community that there are just too many of these portals. Now you're sitting back thinking, well, you know, our portal's pretty easy to use and probably it is. I'm going to even give you the benefit of the doubt and I'm going to say, yeah, it is. But it's easy to use when you have one portal. When you have 6,000 customers and they're using maybe 50 different portals and they all have different ways of accessing them, different websites, little different nuances of how you have to interact with them, it can get to be a problem, okay? Vendors sometimes complain that these portals are difficult to use. Now, I'm going to say take that with a grain of salt. It may be that they're difficult to use, but a lot of them aren't if, and this is a big if, If you've taken the time to either read the manual or the instructions that they've given you, as long as you know what to do, they're not difficult. But again, go back, put yourself in the vendor's shoes. It's not just one portal that they have to learn how to use. It's maybe 30, 50, whatever the number is. And even though each of them isn't difficult, they all have their own nuances. So maybe one, you hit the enter key, another one, you have to do whatever you have to do. You have to go into this particular function or that particular function. And yes, it's easy. But not, again, when you have all these different instructions to remember. The next thing that suppliers complain about with regards to portals that their customers use is that there's a communication issue. Many companies, and you know, you can look inward, I'm not asking any for a show of hands or anything, but many companies, when they start an automation project, once it's up and running, they'll let go some of the staff. So this means that the vendor, the supplier, has no one to talk to when there's a problem. It could be a problem with an invoice. Communication is weak. And so you might say, well, yeah, we don't have necessarily people here all the time for them to talk to, but there's a communication module built into the automation solution. And maybe yes, maybe no. Again, it may be difficult to use. It may not be user-friendly, or even if it is user-friendly, your vendors may not have taken the time to learn how to use it. Because remember, they've got 50 different ones to use, and they really just want to pick up a phone and talk to somebody. So that is a complaint. And the other thing that I I hear from vendors or suppliers is the automation solution has dispute resolution module built into it, which is great, okay? Because this way, you know, you enter your information, they respond back and forth. What the vendor says is, you know, they'll have the back and forth. They don't reach an agreement, okay? Important feature here. They don't reach an agreement, and yet the customer closes out and says it's resolved. So that, needless to say, doesn't make them real happy. The next feature that I want to talk about is the self-service master vendor file feature. And this is where you give the vendor access to the portal with a user ID and password, and then they go in and set themselves up basically in your online master vendor file. Now, this is really a great tool when it comes to fighting this change my bank account fraud because the vendor doesn't call you then or send you an email. They simply go into the portal and make the change. But again, remember, the vendor is now doing work in 50 different portals. So they have to know how to communicate in these 50 different portals, set themselves up in all these different portals. And they are not happy about it. What's more is some of them, I've actually had, you know, credit people scream at me. Yeah, sure, accounts payable likes this. They're pushing all their work on us. And in a few cases, credit departments, billing departments, accounts receivable departments, whatever you want to call it, have had to actually go out and hire staff simply to have somebody to deal with these portals. So vendors not as much in love with this self-service feature as maybe the accounts payable staff is. And then I have what I call the ongoing password challenge. Now, I don't know about you, but if you're like me, I can never remember my passwords. You know, the protocols around passwords to have strong passwords, you know, at least eight characters, have a capital and a small letter, have a number, have a special symbol in them. Some portals, some facilities don't want you to have the special character in it. Some of them want you to change your password every six months. I mean, all these things make sense from a uh, fraud protection standpoint, 
But when you're sitting there and you're like, I have all my regular passwords, which I can't remember. And then now I have these 50 portals and they all have different passwords because you're not supposed to use the same password on each one. It can get to be overwhelming for the professional who has to deal with it. And so what they used to tell you, they don't tell you this anymore, I'm guessing for obvious reasons, is in addition to all the things I just told you, the capitals, change your passwords every six months, don't use the same, they used to also tell you not to write them down. Like, come on, hello. So, you know, now I guess most of us write them down and just try and keep the paper where we write it in a secure location. So this all this crap around passwords just amplifies the problems from the supplier standpoint that they have with all these portals and with all these automation solutions. The next reason why you're not getting the usage out of your automation solution that you thought you were going to get is sometimes, and it pains me to share this with you, but I'm going to, sometimes your accounts payable staff is actually telling your suppliers not to use the portal. Why are they doing this? Because they're concerned about losing their jobs, okay? They're either concerned about it or they don't know how to use it. They haven't been given adequate training. They didn't understand the training, whatever. They are actually telling your suppliers not to use it. So you really need to address that situation. The next complaint that we hear from suppliers is that occasionally the technology doesn't work. We all know that happens. It happens to all of us. If you're like me, sometimes it's my fault, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's actually the app, you know, didn't work. I'm a lot calmer about it now than I used to be. But anyway, when the technology stalls, there's no one to talk to. If they call the service provider, they probably won't help them because they don't know who they are. And they think, for example, they might be a crook. So they've got nobody to talk to. You know, they get into, let's say, upload their invoices or change their bank account number or whatever else it is that you want them to do. They can't get in and there's nobody to talk to. And all they want to do is send you their invoices. So it's something you need to keep in the back of your mind. And as soon as I heard this, it made sense, but it's something I never considered. But all technology, or virtually all technology that we deal with goes through upgrades. And when there is an upgrade in the technology, usually it's supposed to be transparent to the end user, but we all know it never is. Either it doesn't work, or even when it does work, there's something a little different that you have to do. And I don't know, it may be obvious to the rest of the world. It's usually not obvious to me. I mean, some of you are probably in that boat with me. And so this creates a problem for the supplier. And again, they have nobody to talk to because nobody at the supplier side is willing to discuss this with them. When I asked about it, the person who I was talking to was quite knowledgeable about it, told me that between 10 and 15% of the technologies that are out there, the automation solutions tend to have upgrades in any given year. So, you know, this is also just one more challenge. So I'm talking about all these challenges, which you really do need to try and address and maybe take in mind and keep in consideration when you're buying a new module, or if you already have one, you don't have the luxury, you know, trying to address them with your suppliers and your staff. There's really one simple way that all these problems go away. And no, the answer is not that we won't automate because at some point or another, most of us are going to be faced with the challenge from management that, hey, you're going to automate your accounts payable or at least your invoice processing. So here's my simple tip. When you go out to buy a new solution, look for one that can read invoices from email. Because that way, this is completely transparent to your vendor. Your suppliers don't even have to know that you're going down this road of using invoice automation or accounts payable automation because they're just going to keep emailing you their invoices like they already do. If you've watched some of my other stuff, you know I'm all about best practices. So let's take a look at some AP technology best practices, which of course includes AP automation. Now to be clear, I'm not talking about running out and spending a ton of money on new technology. I'm not talking about that at all. I'm talking a little bit about a change of mindset. I believe the evidence is irrefutable. Paper has to go. Now for some, this will mean a change in process and others a change in mindset. But I have to tell you, I believe we all have been inching towards this for some time. And many of us have taken more steps than we realize because we're inching along, okay? I'm not talking necessarily about out and out AP automation. And in fact, I have today to share with you three simple tips, which I believe anyone can take to get away from the paper, if you will, and it won't cost you a red cent. So those three simple 
steps, or as I like to call them, the three tips. Number one, and I think this is a biggie, and again, it won't cost you anything, insist that all your invoices are sent electronically. By this, I mean either using an automation solution or emailing invoices. Those who had taken this step already had a much easier time when COVID hit because they didn't have to worry about how we're going to get our invoices to pay our vendors. The next step is to move away from paper checks, those god-awful paper checks, which are inefficient and very expensive, much more expensive than you realize. You can do this by moving more payments, if you will, just to the company credit card, maybe raising the limit a little bit on that or putting more items towards the company credit card and also, of course, ACA. And tip number three, it's simply learn. You want to learn about all these new technologies that are out there because they're coming our way and a little knowledge can go a long way. Now I want to address an area that often falls through the cracks, the documentation of your AP automation or invoice automation solution. Don't start groaning. You know it has to be done. That's why I've invited a documentation expert to join me for the session. Let's hear what she has. While most professionals understand the importance of documenting new, many would rather undergo a root canal than to sit down and produce the necessary documentation. What's more, this issue is becoming increasingly important as new technology is inundating the accounting, finance, and accounts payable space. So when Marie Mills, a nationally recognized documentation expert, agreed to sit down and chat with us specifically about documenting the use of new technology and automation solutions, I was thrilled. So Marie, many of our listeners are getting new technology in their accounts payable function, mostly accounts payable or invoice automation solutions, but also payment solutions and fraud protection, etc., and others. How do you advise them to start the documentation process after the technology has been installed and the service provider has left? It's a great question. I think the the key here is to not wait until after it's fully installed and to not wait until the software people have left. And the reason for that is as you're going through the implementation, things will come up that are really specific to your organization that you're going to want to capture. And you have the people right there while they're doing the implementation helping you through it. So it's much easier to ask them there then at that time and get really good clarification then later, you know, after the implementation is done and they're gone. And, um, you know, to step back just a minute, you know, why do we document things at all? Well, we document them so we know what to do, when to do it, who's going to do it, how to do it. And very importantly, like how we know it's right, how, we're, how we know we've done it right. Right. So keeping that in mind, think about when you're using software and you have fields to enter, you have data entry to do. So one of the things that will happen that I've seen is that, you know, there's a manual that will tell you what this field is for, what that field is for, but your organization may use it in a very specific way. And you're going to want to capture that and make sure that field is filled out consistently because then that data could be used later in a report. And if people are entering, using that field for different things mm -hmm. or in a different way, then you won't get great reporting results. Mm -hmm. And so like an example would be, there's a company name and you have the company in your, you're entering that into the field, but what if the company has multiple locations? Do you choose the main company name or do you choose the company name with the location? And whichever you choose, you just want to make sure everyone's doing it the same way. And that's so, something, yeah, go ahead. No, 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 no. So when I'm listening to you, I'm thinking about uh, one of the things that I always find troublesome with Excel spreadsheets when I'm trying to use them is percentages. Do you put it in as a decimal or do you put that right. can really throw your results? <laughs> it can throw your great. Right. How many, to what degree of accuracy do you want to go? And whatever you decide, it's like less important, like what you decide, it's more important that everybody do the same thing. Right, right. 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 And that's what the documentation will help you be very consistent and consistency is going to reduce mistakes and make everything more efficient and, and even something like that. So like a notes field, you often see a notes field mm -hmm. and then people get that and they think, well, there's a field, I better put something in there, but you don't want to waste time <laughs> right. entering field, entering information there. Nobody's going to read. So the documentation, you know, this could be very brief. It just could be a table that says, here's the field name and here's what goes in it. And as long as people have that guidance, then they're not wasting their time, but they're also putting in information that you want them to put in. <laughs> 
So we, uh, by, just as an aside, we tell people in accounts payable they should they should set up exactly this for when data is being entered, um, it, and it's a great way to weed out duplicates. But I'm off topic. All right, back to you, Marie. Yeah, well, so really, I mean, in summary, don't wait. And then that's always my my uh, advice around any kind of documentation. As soon as there's something worth writing down, don't wait. Start documenting. And I would imagine if you did that, then you get to do it in little pieces instead of sitting there with this whole massive thing to document. It's much, much less overwhelming for sure. Okay. So you've given us already a few tips and tricks. Do you have any others to make this process a little bit easier for our folks? Yeah. So, uh, you know, if I look to the sides, cause I'm kind of looking at my notes because I always need my notes when I'm um, doing this. So yeah. So create a document early, like what I just said, start the documentation process early, bookmark it so you can find that document easily. So make it really easy for you to find it and open it up. And like with all writing, you're capturing the key content first, and then you're going back and organizing and editing it. So don't worry about making it pretty the first time. It's most important just to capture that content. And then also I would say assign one person to be the primary documentation owner. And then they, it, it's their job to capture those details and make sure they get written down and organized. You know, you see, it's like everybody, you know, if you have a good idea, write it down. And then everybody thinks somebody else is doing it. And nobody does it. And nobody does it. And nobody does it. Yeah. Yeah. And then very important, don't document information that already exists. So okay. you have online help, you have knowledge based information from the software company, put those links in your documentation, but don't repeat the content from those in the knowledge base on your document. It's a waste of time. Right. And once you take it out of their knowledge base, they may update it, but you're going to have the older version. Right. Yeah. And so you're that's going to remember all the different places you did that. <laughs> no, no. Mm -mm. Yeah. So Marie, we've been talking about putting the documentation together, but do you have any tips on how this process can be made easier for those using the documentation? And, and this is a really good point. I'm glad you bring this up because you know you can write all day, but if people don't use it right. and it's not easy for them to use, then it's not really useful. Right. So the key, the first thing to usability is to make it easy to find. And I would always include the name of the software in the documentation title so that people can easily find it on a keyword search. Mm -hmm. It sounds like really like a minor point, but it can really help. So include that software in the, in the document title so that it can find it easy and then make the documentation as easy to read as possible. Mm -hmm. So you're keep, keeping the language very simple, very basic. I mean, honestly, the, the rule of thumb is right at the fifth grade level. Oh, the fifth grade level. Fifth grade level. The eighth grade. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's like, you don't know what people's backgrounds are or, you know, what their, how much, how big their vocabulary is. English may not be their first language. Mm -hmm. There is no advantage to making the wording complex. There's no advantage to using a big fancy word if you can use a simple word. So keep the language simple. Don't use jargon, don't use acronyms, you know, anything that confuse people and uh, include context. So don't tell, you know, do this, you better do that. And don't forget to do this, but also tell them why. Okay. It, it just helps people when okay. they're following directions. Do you advocate them including a table of contents? Yes, if it's long, that's a good question. Uh, if it is long, and I am a strong advocate for short, shorter documents, right? So if it requires a table of contents, I might think, well, maybe it's a little too long. And then instead I would break it into multiple documents that you can then link to. It, this, those shorter documents, even though there may be more of them are actually easier to yeah. keep up to date and easier to manage. Yeah. And mm -hmm. do you advocate like bullet points? Yes. Oh my gosh. I think I always say I was born thinking in bullet points. You know, I always, I think in outlines and bullet points and white space and indents and headers, you know, using style headers to help the eye really visually right. you know, right. follow, follow right. the information. I, I used to edit a publication that had uh, contributions made by lawyers and, <laughs> you know, I'd get this document and it would be like these paragraphs would be like this, and my eyes would just glaze yeah. over. <laughs> yeah. And, it, you know, I also advocate, this is kind of getting more into the details um, beyond what this podcast is about, but using a template, a very basic template that is like context and then your process overview and then below that the process details. And it just really helps um, 
keep the information organized and yes. consistent looking. So if you're used to looking at a document that's laid out a certain way and then all your documents are laid out that way, it's actually much easier for the user. Right. I wouldn't have thought of that, but that's a good point. So Marie, before we get to the part that most people overlook, perhaps you could tell the audience a little bit about what you do. Yeah. So I work with businesses. I work with for-profit, non-profit businesses. Uh, I work with academic institutions and I help them ca identify, capture, streamline, and document their processes. And oftentimes they're coming to me because they're growing and they're having trouble growing because their processes are not written down and they're not clear. And in order for a process to be clear, it really does need to be written down. Right. right. And, and it's very hard to make a process more efficient if it's not written down. And, right. And the other issue that comes up is that people have been at the company for many years and they do a really good job and the company, the organization has become very dependent upon them showing up every day for work. And then they give notice and you got two or three weeks. And I tell you, I have had people just call me like their eyes are bugging out and their chest is tight. And, you know, they're literally in a panic because they know that person is a gold mine of information it's not written down and there's, it's gonna be very difficult to capture all of it in the two or three weeks remaining. So I always encourage people, that's what start early, start start as soon as you need to write something down, start writing it down and, uh, and don't wait. Yeah. yeah, it's really easy though when you're overworked oh to gosh. push the documentation uh, and then before you know it, it's two years and there you go. All right. Um, is there any part of the process that people overlook? Anything that you'd suggest they add? Yeah. So in general, I would say what I see often is missing is just like the basic, almost what people would say, oh, that's common sense or that's easy. We don't need to write that down, but super useful. Like mm -hmm. in your document, find the link to the online help and to the online manual and put that front and center. So it's very easy just to get to it. There's no surf clicking around. And then also think through from a user perspective, how am I using this? Well, what's gonna, what am I gonna do if something goes wrong? What if the software crashes on me or I get stuck or something happens? And to have a pretty simple process that just says, well, step one, first, reboot. Maybe that's it, reboot. And step two, call techni technical support. If you have in-house technical support, then you wanna give that contact information. If you want them to actually contact the software technical support, then make that clear, um, which sometimes you don't, right? You don't yeah. want every individual contacting the software tech right, support. Right, so, right. So just be very clear on how you want that to flow. And then it, this goes back to having one process document owners. You know, really, if, if somebody has a question, if I have a question, mm -hmm. you're probably going to have the same question or a similar question. So as the questions come up, document the question and the answer right. so that people have it as a reference and you don't have to keep reinventing wheels so to speak it, it always reminds me i know like as professionals we always like look at the advanced issues and all this and i'm always reminded i got an instant pot a few years ago as a gift and i read the documentation and i could not figure out how to, how to use the pot <laughs> and the first thing they they suggested is that you boil a cup of water and i literally looking at those directions i couldn't figure it out and i got online and i looked for a youtube how to boil water in an instant pot and I, there were a number of them but i couldn't <laughs> It was amazing the number of views that these videos have gotten. And so often we focus on the advanced stuff, that yes. the very basic stuff, like how to turn the computer on, uh, you know, yes. you know and, I, and I'm sure you've run into this, where you've had a piece of software and it says click on this, and you can't find where whatever they're telling you to click on is, that yeah. they assume everybody knows. And that's, that's a really big thing, Mary, is it's, you know, people, once you know it, certain information, once you know it, you'll remember it. But if you don't know it, right. It, it, it can stop you dead and you're just like, well, why, why didn't they include that? And there is this, um, like this constant awareness you need to have about what if I had never done this before? Right. What do I need to know? What do right. I, because you're always, and this is the key, you're always writing the documentation, not for the person who knows the job really well, you're writing it for the person who doesn't. Clearly automation is changing the landscape of the business world, especially the accounting function and more specifically the accounts payable space. So I'm joined here by several industry thought leaders for an informative discussion on the future of technology and automation 
in Accounts Payable. Today we have a real treat, a panel of experts from diverse backgrounds who are going to discuss the future of automation and technology in Accounts Payable. We have representatives from both sides of the Atlantic, as well as representing the user community. That's me and you, Jamie. We're complimented by Richard, who is joining us as an invoice automation expert. And of course, I'm thrilled once again to have one of the leading authorities on P cards and lawsuits. So let me kick it off right away. Looking into your crystal ball, what functions do you think will be automated in most accounts payable departments in the next five to 10 years? And you might want to differentiate if it's appropriate between large and small and mid-sized companies, say those with under $250 million in annual sales. Lynn, if you just want to focus on the payment piece, since that's your ballpark, if you will, that would be appreciated. So how about you, Jamie? You want to start? Yeah, I think generally, I think if you're looking at, you know, sort of the next five, 10 years, it's definitely the invoice processing area. That's where there's a lot of mundane tasks. It's where there's a lot of resource. So I would definitely suggest that's, and we're already seeing that in the UK and Europe, we're already seeing a lot of automation going into there. And I think Richard's probably the better person to answer that question. So over <laughs> to you, Richard. Yeah, he lives oh, with it every day. <laughs> I do, I do. And I agree that that is where... A lot of the mundane tasks are happening in the AP process today. You know, we've, we've already seen the largest companies on the planet have adopted a lot of strategies. You know, companies of 250 million plus in sales, you know, they've automated and they've automated many aspects of what they do in payables already. When you start to look at the smaller companies, it gets a little bit harder to implement some of the more sophisticated processes. So. Things like vendor portals, you know, PO creation, uploading of invoices and the intake, data extraction, OCR, these are all components of an AP automation toolkit, as we call it. Then you get into the specifics of workflows and routing and PO matching and then ERP integration. So these are all you know, different pieces of the puzzle. What I think you'll start to see, though, over the next five to 10 years is, and we're seeing some of this already today, where some of the service providers, the solutions out there are starting to embrace or embed these components into a single source. So if you look back five years or even today, you see that there are providers that play a part or have a role in each separate component. I think what you're going to start to see is these are all going to start to come together in a single solution. I wouldn't be surprised if you start to see the ERP vendors ah. start to include some of these pieces. Now, it's happening today. When you look at the new players, the net suites, the work days, they're starting to embed. So they, they realize they're missing part of the action. And they're starting to include some of these components to make it easier on, I'll say, the, the companies under $250 million and down to be able to adopt some of these processes. Up until now, the biggest of the big have been, you know, they're using vendor portals. They'll, they've outsourced payments or they're using P cards or virtual cards, or, you know, they've, they've implemented some level of even payment automation. But I think you'll start to see the, the ERP vendors play a role in this in the future. I kind of laugh when I hear you say that, Richard, because I've been predicting that for a number of years. But my second part of that is that you can't wait for the ERP systems to do it, to say, okay, I'm not going to worry about invoice automation or AP automation because my, you know, I use whatever I use, SAP, NetSuite, whatever you use, because mm -hmm. it, it won't really happen soon enough. Do you, do you agree? Yeah, I, I agree. You know, the ability to go paperless has been around actually for a very long time, yeah. even in accounts payable. Mm -hmm. I remember back in the late 90s yes. when EDI came out. EDI was going to solve everyone's problem. EDI was going to eliminate paper. EDI was going to streamline things. And here we are today, 20 or 30 years later. And again, some, some organizations have adopted EDI Many haven't because of the technical aspects, the resources, yeah. the cost to implement, and the Walmarts of the world, the General Motors, the Fords, they've, they can impose their business rules on their suppliers just because of the massive size of the organization. Mm -hmm. 
but you know the smaller companies are going to real you know rely on their tools like Workday or NetSuite or SAP or their their ERP partner to start to include some of these things. And I see I think you'll start to see that. We're already seeing it today. It will it will be a slow progression, but it will get there. Yeah. So Lynn, what about the payment side? Well, you know, first I have to comment, Richard, on on what you were saying. You know, you think back to some of the, well, you used EDI as an example, but I'm even thinking about the e-procurement, the early systems where, oh, it was all the rage, you know, let's make this more streamlined. And then everybody kind of forgot about the payment piece or, you know, or the invoice piece as an example. So I think we have a long history of sort of piecing together all the components of a, of a procure to pay or purchase to pay. So I guess on the payments front now, maybe Mary, I'm speaking from, you know, my own dream here, but I think some of these AP automation systems need to get more robust in helping an organization enforce its payment strategy, if you will, or if they even go as far as having a payments policy. And what I mean is take some of that guesswork or we'll call it maverick behavior, perhaps out of the hands of the AP staff. So if someone in AP gets a call from a supplier that says, well, I know you've got me set up for ACH, but you know, I'd rather you just send me a check payment. And that person goes into the system and just changes it because the supplier asked for it, you know, having mechanisms in there to prevent that from happening. And I'll be the first to admit, I don't know the ins and outs of every feature of every AP system. And and I'm sure Richard is far better at that or Jamie. But I do think there has to be more structure or controls to help an organization execute the payments that it wants for each vendor, not letting other people interject and change it up just because they want to. We could, and I'm going to mention it, and then we probably could have another session on this, talk about the automation solutions that seem to push organizations to pay all their bills with some sort of a card payment. (laughs) <laughs> but, well, we'll, we'll leave that mm-hmm. for, uh, we'll leave that for another time because all right so we see a lot about self-service vendor portals and i want to make it clear because when that term can mean a lot of things that in this specific case what i mean by self-service vendor portals are master vendor files or what i like to call master vendor files on steroids where the vendor sets themselves up so what do you see as the future for this given that there's been a lot of pushback from the supplier community. You know, we in AP think it's great, but the supplier community, not so happy about it. So Richard, since this probably comes most to us. <laughs> you know, on paper, it sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> the pitch to AP to have a vendor service themselves, provide their documentation, upload information, submit invoices. It sounds, it sounds like magic, right? It's a dream come true, but if you're absolutely, you're right. The vendors, the suppliers hate them. They, you know, think about just, think about you're a, you're, you're a manufacturer. You've got thousands of customers, right? Right. Each one uses a different vendor portal. Just imagine the, the massive amount of logins, the data, the de- now, yes, now, systems you've got to upload and keep track of. And then now let's throw in the last 18 months of employee turnover. Who's responsible? How do you manage that? So suppliers, you're right. There's a lot of pushback because once you start to force them into using and submitting their own information, managing this data, now you've just burdened them with more tasks, more work, more more systems that they've got to manage on their own and they just are pushing back it's not it's not the magic that it was meant to be ap the idea vendors don't i see this playing out in one of two ways and i don't have a strong opinion one is the vendors will win and they just will stop doing it i have one credit manager scream at me at a, at a function, at a credit function, when I was talking about this, about how wonderful they were, she screamed, I have 6,000 customers. Do I have to go into every single one? And I was like, oh, well, she's got a point. So this can either become credit or accounts receivable function where they actually hire somebody to do it or they just don't do it anymore. It also helps with the 
I change my bank account for it because the vendor would go in and change it themselves. So who do you think is going to win, Richard? Oh, I don't know. I, I think the suppliers are going to win in the end. Nope. I really do. I think that when push comes to shove, they'd rather just press a button and send an email and call Me it a day. Too. Me too. Lynn, what do you think? Well, I, I agree. I mean, I can even speak as a supplier, being that I'm a consultant in the commercial card space. What I found, one of my craziest stories is one of my customers had me use such a solution and they gave me a PDF of instructions. So, you know, I know Mary and your podcasts, you've talked about, you know, give suppliers some training, yeah. but I had, I had a PDF. And so I'm diligently following the instructions. The instructions were wrong. And so I know you have all used the example of, of say a manufacturer with thousands of customers and potentially using just dozens and dozens of systems. But even as a small supplier, like I am, it's tedious. I spent just a huge amount of time basically telling my customer that their instructions to their AP automation system were wrong. I said, these aren't right and help me, you know, figure out what I need to do to get myself set up. So, you know, we can do business together. So as a supplier, you know, already suppliers are, I think, disenchanted maybe by all the different, you know, hoops that they're kind of forced to jump through in many cases. So there has to be something where, you know, both sides benefit and there's some common ground. So not a winner or loser per se, but we've got to take the burden off suppliers. Right. Okay. And Jamie, do you see the same thing over in the UK? We do, we do. But, I, you know, let me answer this from a user perspective. You know, that's probably the, the one. So from a solutions point of view, I get it. And from a supplier's point of view or customer's point of view, but from an AP practitioner point of view, our community absolutely think it's best practice to have some form of front end onboarding solution of some sort. Because let's be honest, the issue that we always face is it poor communication at the start, which creates all the issues for the process with accounts payable or procure to pay. So the better quality data you get at the very front of the process, it will mean better quality data further down. Now, but I do agree with Richard and Lynn's points on, you know, who wants to sign into 6,000 different vendor portals? <laughs> to happen. But I would say that, you know, what Richard mentioned earlier about ERP systems taking the lead, I can definitely see, you know, your SAPs of the world having better vendor boarding solutions, because that would make sense. Because if they rolled that out across their platforms, you'd have one platform to load yourself onto rather than multiple third party vendors. But from a, from a user perspective, it is absolutely best practice to have some front end onboarding system because it's better quality data. Yeah, it is. It is. I've actually heard from some of my credit friends that some suppliers are actually having to hire somebody to actually input this. And when I heard that, I thought, well, that's a great opportunity for an AP person. It's a great job since they probably understand the portals better. And so maybe we'll see some, some more of that. All right. Before we continue, perhaps each of you could take a moment to introduce yourself and your organization. And for our listeners, we've got links to these organizations in the show notes below. So Lynn, why don't you lead off? Thanks, Mary. Well, as I've alluded to already, I've been in the commercial card space. I stopped counting at year 20, but it's been more than 20 years. Started on the practitioner side, managing a P card and travel card program for an organization. So I'm, I'm well aware of some of the pains that the user side goes through in, in all these different topics. And then most recently, well, I guess it's been more than seven years now, I have been Working Recharged Education is a consulting organization that I started. Okay. And Lynn works with both end users and providers. service providers. Service providers. Right. So Richard is here wearing two hats, I guess, as is Jamie. He represents, yeah. he has a LinkedIn group, <laughs> which you can mm -hmm. tell us about, and you work for an AP automation company. So why don't you tell us about both? Yeah. Yeah. And thank you for doing this today and inviting me. I appreciate it. So I'm the founder of the Accounts Payable Best Practices Group on LinkedIn. That group's been in place for a number of years now. We've grown to 15,000 members worldwide. All day long, I get messages from people all over the globe who are thinking about or investigating and exploring ways to improve their payables process. And it's not even just about AP automation. I get all types of questions and asking about best practices and they, they share questions and comments and feedback 
even to other group members. So it's a great group. If you're not a member, if you're watching this today, I'd encourage you to take a look. And if you think there's something here for you, click the join button. A lot of great information out there. The flip side of that hat is that I am an AP automation consultant. So I do work for Vision 360 Enterprise is our solution used by our clients for exactly what we're talking about today in, in many of these areas. So I do this oftentimes during a meeting. I say when I started a work with AP clients, I had some I had some hair on my head. That's how long it has been. I don't want to date myself, but I've been doing this a very long time and, and work with clients and companies all around the globe. And and it's really about helping them improve their processes. So AP automation is a great fit. And and Jamie, you've got a little bit of a different background. <laughs> I have indeed. I've got a similar hairstyle to Richard, though, I'd say. Probably it's the, it's the <laughs> out of the world, it, it makes us lose our hair. Yeah, so I, my my background, you know, I'm the founder and chief executive of an organization called the Accounts Pebble Association. We are predominantly a UK focused organization, although we do have members and supporting organizations around the globe. Very similar to Richard, we have a LinkedIn group also. Um, I'm a member of Richard's group. It's an exceptional group, so yes. go and join and Thank you. get involved in that. And, and Richard bring, pulls out some really good content there. We also have a group called the AP Forum, relatively large group. We've got about 50,000 members now. So that's that's an excess, you know, great growth going group. My background is, yes, from the age of 16, I've been in Purchase Ledger, which we call in the UK. Now accounts payable, obviously, for, for more of a sort of a corporate sound. And I'm not going to give my age away, but that's over 30 years ago. So that's, and I have lost all my hair because of that, Richard. <laughs> and Jamie, you have an event coming up. You want to tell us a little bit about that? I do, absolutely. And, and for all the people listening, you're all invited, cordially invited. We have a conference every year. We, we always invite the one and only guru, which is Mary Schaefer, to my right on my left on the screen. <laughs> Mary's running a panel for us live on the day. It's on the 19th of October. If you wanted to sign up, the website address is apcon.online. I think Mary's going to put some on the show notes as well. But you're all welcome. It's a global panel that we've got in it throughout the day. So it's global interest, lots of stuff which would interest Lynn and Richard, all about, you know, payments. It's This year's theme is the Accounts Payable Best Practice Toolkit. So it's all about what can we do, what can we provide. So all's welcome. Um, and you've got my ugly face during the session as well, so you can listen oh. to my dulcet tones throughout the day. And there's, he has one other thing which I am so excited about. In the UK, there's a program called Loose Women. I compare it to The View here without the politics. <laughs> and one of the hosts on that, Brenda Edwards, is going to come speak. And the reason that I'm really excited about Brenda coming to speak is Brenda started her career in accounts payable, and she talks about it frequently. So I can't wait to hear what Brenda has to say. Okay. Uh, enough about that. Lynn, over to you. And then, guys, if you want to address this, you're welcome to. Do you think AP automation solutions need to accommodate P card payments, or do you view P cards as a separate issue? Well, you can probably guess already that, of course, they have to address P card payments. But I think just to back up for a minute, you know, P cards or purchasing cards are just one type of commercial card product. And every organization has a little bit of a different approach when it comes to the cards they're using. I think Richard already alluded to virtual cards as another type. And so I think these solutions, because every organization is a little different, just naturally have to accommodate card payments and make it an option in these systems. And, you know, as I said earlier, to, to help organizations enforce the type of payment that they're trying to use with a particular supplier. Now, you know, if someone says, well, P-card should be separate, you know, again, I think that could stem from the, the intent, if you will, when P-cards first started, they were intended to take invoices out of AP. And so some might say, well, then you don't want them in an automation solution. But again, you don't know how an organization is using a P card. Many, all of you know this, will have someone in accounts payable that still will pay a vendor via a P card. Even though in a perfect world, you're using P cards for, you know, maybe smaller purchases and it does reside outside of the AP realm. But 
not knowing that, I think AP solutions need to be flexible. They need to accommodate whatever choices an organization wants to use. Richard, do you want to weigh in on that at all? Or are you well, about the Lynn's yeah, expertise? Yeah, I mean, I got to rely on Lynn's expertise. She's right. I mean, P cards are typically P cards is a separate discussion, separate focus, but I agree. They were they were originally intended to eliminate the invoice to put some some controls in place around mm-hmm. spending, and they they tend to be viewed as a separate component. Mm-hmm. And I would say we're even guilty of that in our own solutions. But yeah, they should be incorporated. Virtual cards are, are incorporated in, in solutions these mm-hmm. days. P cards are not. I can't really explain why, but it's just viewed as a separate component. And, you know, there's some complexities there with P cards that you don't have with standard payments, Mm -hmm. but it's the controls that are important and, Mm -hmm. you know, having them as as part of an overall solution, I I think it would be key, but we're just not there today. Will we be there in the future? Probably, uh, but we're just not there right now with them. Jamie, you have anything that you want to add to that? No, look, I agree with both. I think, yeah, best practice would be you'd implement a P card within your, your solution of sort. Um, and I agree, Richard, in the UK and Europe, we're probably not there yet. People use them, they utilize them, they, they probably use them for all the wrong reasons, not the right reasons. Right. What, what I would say is, that, is just make sure they're not shortcutting bad practice. So, you know, mm-hmm. because you put a P card in place, that doesn't mean that you don't have a purchase order process or a no PO, no PO, pay process, et cetera. But again, the other thing is that, you know, we push as as practitioners, we put, you know, best practices to try and get early payment discounts. Actually, P cards can help you achieve that because obviously you can then pay people in advance effectively rather than go through the entire process. So lots of benefits, but we're not quite there in the UK and Europe also. Well, and Mary, I think, you know, looking back, I mean, even in my days of managing a program, my organization had an ERP system, which did not accommodate P card payments. And, And now we're going back a ways. But because we so wanted to use them, we actually, you know, Jamie, you were saying don't do bad practices. Well, we did, you know, we sort of, you know, undid the process mm-hmm. just to be able to insert P cards into the mix, but the ERP system wasn't intended to, to go that way. So we said, oh, the heck with that process, let us do our own thing. And it wasn't the best idea, but. <laughs> it was the only one at the time that would work. <laughs> There you go. We can't talk about accounts payable, or at least I can't, without discussing fraud. Do you think fraud detection tools will be built into accounts payable automation products in the future? And Lynn, maybe you could touch on fraud detection features in some of the P-card products and what you see on that front. So how about, Jamie, we haven't started with you. Do you want to start? Yeah, absolutely. You know what? I think if you look at a lot of the ERP systems and the solution providers, They all profess to say they've got duplicate checks, they've got some form of fraud protection, but do they really? You know, I think some have some systems and some tools that can probably highlight where there's been a duplicate or an overpayment or whatever it will be. But I actually see the future, we've got to start investing and putting these fraud prevention tools really embedded into the finance function, purely on the basis that, let's be honest, the fraudsters are on the way up, they're becoming more clever, they're becoming the, the frauds are becoming more complex to try and combat. Mary, you're a big advocate of this about communication and mm-hmm. making sure people are aware of what's going on. The only way to really combat is one, communicate so people are aware, but two, let's get better with our own solutions, our own systems. So yeah, I'm an absolute advocate. You need to try and embed these in, in this, the systems you've got, but don't rely on what the ERP systems are giving you today they're not good enough I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you that's the my personal view yeah unfortunately i think you're right do you agree richard yeah i agree with what jamie said you know fraud is a hot topic right now we're seeing it across the globe we're seeing it in different shapes and forms the fraudsters or criminals however you want to classify them they are very smart and they can spoof an email address make an email look legit send you what seems to be a legit invoice or purchase order, get you to click on a link and they're in. So I agree that the AP automation tools, they have checks and balances. They may market it or call it fraud protection, but it's not true fraud protection. I would say right now, as we're talking, there are companies and software organizations scrambling to come up with the methods or the the tools to put in place. But It's not true fraud prevention. It's checks and balances to validate data 
accuracies, information, and make sure things are legit to a point. But yeah, I think it has to happen. Fraud is not going away. It's getting worse and worse every day. It's getting more realistic. It's getting trickier to decipher or to even be able to understand it and recognize it. And we're always, even in our own group, we're sharing examples. Mm -hmm. Um, People send me examples. I got an email, even myself, not too long ago from an accounts payable department who will remain nameless, where it asked me for an updated invoice and wasn't even a client. And that's a giveaway. Where that was coming from or where it went, I notified the the company and they were not even aware that they had been hacked. So it's happening. But yeah, it has to fraud prevention and fraud controls. They they have to be included, built in. And I'm sure if smarter people than than I right now are working on it, but it will be coming. Um, It will be slow to, to get rolled out, but we'll see fraud prevention in a more stable form. Hopefully soon, it's needed. It's a must have. Yeah, it is needed. So, Lynn, we've talked a lot about this. I know you have some strong opinions. Well, I agree already with what's been said, but you know, your question made me think about all the robust third party auditing solutions that exist today, not just for car transactions, but many of them also can address, you know, invoices and payments. So, I'm thinking if there is a component in these AP automation solutions, that can not only look for say duplicate payments as Jamie mentioned, but also try to identify things that look like anomalies within the invoice. You know, and not that that would prevent all fraud, but just continue to, you know, build out, you know, what these solutions are capable of doing or identifying. So, you know, it's it's a matter of, you know, is there some kind of artificial intelligence that can look at an invoice to say, Normally these invoices look like this for this dollar amount, and this is the timing. And today they look a little different and and try to alert, you know, AP before payments get out the door. Yeah. You know, that would be ideal. Yeah. Yeah. And the big key there is before they get out the door, because once they're out the door, it's really hard to get that money back. Unless it's on a card, Mary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put my plug in for, for using card payments that have some of these uh, more robust fraud mm-hmm. protections. That you step very, right into that. Yeah, I know I did. <laughs> That's a very good point also. Uh, okay. She's got a point there. What, if any, accounts payable automation features do you think will be non-existent, let's say 10 years from now? And Richard, you know you're going to get picked on for first for this. I am. So, so automation features that will be non-existent. Hmm. That's an interesting question. How about you know, portals? You know, yeah, I think if anything, maybe, uh, I, I don't think that will ever truly go away, but I think that you'll see less and less user adoption. Uh, like I said, suppliers will push back. I mean, I can't think of anything that will truly be non-existent that exists today. I I think the things that we see today will continue to improve like OCR and data accuracy. But I I really think that you'll start to see these. I think what you'll start to see over the next five to 10 years is more mergers and acquisitions. Mm -hmm. You'll start to see P card companies, vendor portals, AP automation, procurement, you'll start to see all of these providers and tools start to join forces. And I think you'll start to see more single source solutions. So I think it'll go the opposite way. I don't think things will be non-existent. I think you'll start to see more, the marketplace is is, is shrinking as more and more companies are adopting. You'll start to see more of these organizations join forces, combine efforts, put their solutions together to eventually a single source solution. And ultimately, it's going to wind up, I think, years from now. And and my friends in the industry aren't going to like what I'm about to say, but I think it's all leading towards the ERP solutions to embrace all of this. So I'm not making any friends right now, even in my own organization, but I I think it will come eventually. But it will be years before we truly see that. There's one feature that I think will go away. It's gone away almost completely, but I still occasionally hear about it. And that is solutions 
that actually charged the supplier for submitting the invoice. Oh. I, I mean, the first time I heard that, I was like, what? <laughs> you bought something <laughs> for me and now I have to pay you to Not send you my bill? <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, when, when e even when vendor portals and, and, you know, first came into the marketplace, there was a charge, the vendor was charged a fee to upload their invoice. Yeah, I don't think that exists today, and I, I hope that's gone for good. But you're right. I think that will be certainly a thing of the past if it isn't already. That's the only thing I can come up with. And do <laughs> so, Jamie, you have any other? You look at it a little differently than we do. Yeah, look, you know, I, I agree with what Richard said generally. I think I, I would say that most organizations will either form mergers. Um, they're already doing it. They're, they're creating larger partner networks. They're having end-to-end -end solutions. It might be three or four vendors to support, but they are, you know, congregating already. So I would suggest that end-to-end P2P systems will become the norm, and I think that'll be globally. The one thing I would say, though, is, and again, I'll go back to the practitioner model here, Mary, and I'm hopefully you'll support this, is when these techie people design these systems, get the community involved, get the people who actually use the systems involved, because it's one thing getting a techie solution that does all the things that a techie person and can mm -hmm. but actually the people on the you know the front line the people who are using the solutions the people that see the day-to-day -day transactional volumes and issues they have they're the people they need to reach out and get those user feedback to design these solutions for the future we had one company over here i will not say the name and this goes back probably 10 to 15 years so i don't think it would happen today but the company actually spent a million dollars developing its own in-house procure to pay system. And the last step said, and then they'll make the payment. There, there was no input from AP and, and the whole system failed. So wow. hopefully, yeah, yeah. Lynn, what, what do you think? Well, it was funny, as soon as you asked the question, I immediately went where Richard went, that it's not so much what AP automation features will go away, it's more what other companies will go away. You're not right. going to have like a standalone imaging solution anymore, oh, yeah. okay. uh, you know, as an example, or I even from a payments perspective, right. I think about organizations that will do a request for proposal or RFP for maybe an integrated payable solution that now you're seeing increasingly being part of these AP automation solutions. So it might be a case where, well, we're not gonna bid this out anymore because our AP solution offers it to us. So I, I, I think it is that consolidation and you know, bringing, making mega solutions that can do it all. And maybe even now, dare I say, Mary, as I used to be a former procurement person, I don't want your audience to groan, but it's that piece too that has to come into play you know because of a procurement department sets up a contract and establishes payment terms how is that information passed along to ap so if these ap automation solutions can work with the procurement department any contracts with vendors and and, and get all that piece you know more tightly put together then everyone will win um, from that standpoint Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. All righty. Maybe Lynn, we'll start with you again. Can you share any advice you might have for our audience who might be looking for an automation solution for their accounts payable function or their procure to pay function? Let's put it that way. Well, you know, what I hear from multiple organizations when you're talking about any type of new technology that they might be investigating, nobody seems to know, and I'm sure Jamie, you can attest to this too. No one in an organization seems to have the complete picture. So it's like somebody wants to implement invoice automation, not knowing that that can break certain other processes over here or over here because they only know their lane. And so unless you get more people within an organization or at least have all the right stakeholders involved, so you know what can go wrong as you're improving you know process a don't make process b and c you know break or become you know more tedious so i mean i think the advice would be just get all the right people on board including those procurement people and you know map out where does data flow today what does it have to be you know interfaced or integrated with and make sure that you're not you know inadvertently you know creating a hiccup somewhere else good point how about you richard yeah i mean 
definitely good points Lynn makes. Getting all the, the stakeholders in the same room and, and reviewing, you know, the, the potential touch point and where things could you know, ultimately go wrong. And, you know, since, since I'm on the delivery side of a lot of these systems and solutions, oftentimes we see change in the fact that now someone's got to make a decision on change is oftentimes a very difficult process. So, you know, sometimes a, a company will say to me, well, where do you think, where could things go wrong? Where are the obstacles in AP automation? I always say it's change. It's getting the stakeholders together to make a decision on a new process, a change, a best practice, how to proceed. And, you know, on the surface, all systems look alike these days. You know, it's very hard to differentiate visually. They all have dashboards, they all have an interface, they all look and feel the same, they all have a similar flow. But how is it going to affect change and, and how easily can that change be implemented? And of course, you have things like integration and, and, and integrating different aspects of the procurement or payments or ERP. Those are all considerations. But yeah, I, I definitely agree. Getting the stakeholders in one place, blueprinting that process and how it's going to affect you. And that is a critical step. And oftentimes that's missed. Sometimes sometimes departments aren't hearing about AP automation until it's underway. And then they raise the flag and say, well, what about me? How are we affected? What about this? And now you're putting the cart before the horse and it's a little too late at that point. But getting the stakeholders in and making sure everybody's on the same page is really critical to the success. Okay. Sam? Maybe I have... Oh, I was going to say, I have a question for Richard once we allow Jamie to answer, too. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh -oh. Pressure, Jamie. It's, it's your turn. <laughs> uh, look, I'm gonna, I'm, a couple of points. You know, I agree with both, again, what Lynn and Richard have said. I liken, you know, choosing an automation or going down that road. It's like going to the gymnasium, going to the gym to try and work out and get fit. But the, there's a saying in the UK, and it says you can't outrun a bad diet. So it's the same with processes. Don't try and put an automation solution in. If you've got a bad process, it won't fix anything. Look at your processes, get your people together, fix the processes, and then hopefully what the automation solution will do is improve the process, not fix it. That's that's the number one. But when it then right. comes to actually choosing a solution partner, no doubt you don't want to speak to Richard because he'll, he'll want to sell you something. But but ultimately, <laughs> you, you know, it's uh, as Richard, you know, you, got, you want somebody that's going to talk to you honestly. You want to have somebody that you can work with, somebody that's got, you know, you clearly got testimonials from, but actually somebody that fits within your business and the culture of your business and understands what you do as an industry, as an organization. That's where I would say, go and choose your automation part on those sort of keynotes. So Lynn, you had a question for Richard? Well, you had a question? Jamie alluded to it, actually. I was going to ask Richard, but it, it really is for either one of you or Mary too. Given that so many of these systems look alike, you know, in terms of feature, yep, 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 check, check. Then what do you think the biggest differentiators are when you're choosing a solution? But Jamie just pointed out you have things like the cultural fit and, and their ability to understand what you're trying to accomplish. But I don't know if, Richard, you can add to that. Is it the customer service? Well, I, yeah, hear, get when I hear the answer, Richard, the price. Oh, I, I... <laughs> The price often has an effect. You know, price is usually down. When I ask people where where do the, the things fall in order of importance, usually price is down here. Yeah, they, they all look alike. They'll you know you'll hear pitches about we all do they, they all do very similar things. You know, ease of use, the experience of the organization, is it a cultural fit? Does it feel like an accounts payable process? You know, Jamie said early on about systems developed by techies. A lot of these systems out there are, they're developed by techies who have never touched an invoice or processed an invoice in their life. So, you know, does the system flow and feel like an accounts payable process? Now, a lot of them do, a lot of them don't. And user adoption is critical. Yeah. If, the user community, and we've all been involved in, in rollouts of systems and solutions and softwares where we hated it, right? We don't want to use it. You know, having a piece of paper was easier than having to 
sign up for a vendor portal, submit my information, and, and jump through hoops. So, you know, it's got to be easy. It's got to feel like an accounts payable process. But, but I would say probably the most important aspect is the service after the sale, right? It's when things aren't working properly, when there are questions, when we need change, when the process that we thought would fit doesn't fit anymore. When procurement says this isn't working for us, how do we make those changes and will that provider be there to help and assist? And, and most of the time, that is the biggest differentiator is that will they be there to help when you need it? Because you know everybody's going to need some help. Yeah, you're not going to know that answer until you're underway. And I tell everybody that. You know, whether it's through references and reference checks and conversations with current users, make sure that organization is going to be there to help you when you need it the most. And that is critical. Why is no one talking about the increase in the workload of almost every accounts payable department? We keep hearing about smaller accounts payable department due to the supposed decrease in work thanks to automation but that does not address the very real issue of the increased workload every best practice organization has, often thanks to automation, as I'll explain. For if organizations don't address these issues, they'll end up with fraud so massive they could sink. If you work in accounts payable or have responsibility for it, you probably know that the workload has increased. Alas, that increase is almost invisible to management since all they see is an automation solution which is supposed to reduce the workload. And to be fair, it probably does in the long run. But in the short run, it's a different story and there are other factors that come into play when you're talking about the accounts payable function. So let's start with this as our first way that AP work is increasing. Now, implementing and getting a full utilization of an automation solution doesn't happen overnight, and it doesn't happen without a lot of upfront effort. Um, and that is more than you might imagine. It's not one of these things where you, you know, push the button, the automation solution just, and while it does reduce some of the workload, it will not completely offset the rest of what I'm going to discuss. So expect an increase in the beginning, especially as you're trying to hold the hands of some of your vendors, trying to get them to use it, and then don't forget some of the others. Okay how your workload increases number two. This involves duplicate invoices and weeding them out and weeding out fraudulent invoices. As you know, vendors have been sending two and three and four copies of an invoice and those have to be weeded out so you don't pay twice. Now, you might say, yes, we're doing that. And yes, you are. But keep in mind that about 25% of all invoices are sent more than once. And this is a, quite a bit of work to, to weed them out and to make sure they don't get paid twice. Okay, so, but there's no place where we say, hey, you know what, we're getting all these extra invoices, let's hire another person to work on it. It just doesn't seem to work that way. Now, you might be saying, well, what about the invoice number? Isn't that invoice number, uh, won't that help us because our the software solution, our ERP, will not accept a duplicate invoice number? And yeah, that helps a little bit, but emphasis on a little bit. It has, did not turn out to be the silver bullet that many thought it would be. And I, by the way, I did also, okay? Because there are ways to get around that. And unfortunately, many of your uh, staff knows it. So while the invoice number helps, it's not the silver bullet. So your people are spending more time. The next issue that is creating more work and accounts payable is the increase in regulatory compliance issues. And this is a huge one. And we're seeing it not only in the United States, but around the world. In the United States, uh, we have now 1099 reporting requirements, not only at the federal level, but we're also seeing a number of the states have their own uh, 1099 reporting requirements. So this is additional work. Every organization then needs to check the state websites and comply at the state level in addition to the federal level. And that is a massive increase. In much of Europe, Latin America, Asia Pacific, we now see organizations having, or countries actually having mandatory electronic invoicing. And so there's the extra work as your uh, staff starts, you know, gearing up for that, making sure that you can comply and making sure that they can, you know, meet the different guidelines in different countries. And if you're, in, if you're um, operating in more than one country, this is additional work, you know, as each country has their own guidelines. 
and it can be extra work in the U.S. if your organization is operating in some of these uh, countries, if you're a, you know, a multinational. Okay, I could go on for that for a long time, but I'll spare you and I won't. So the way that workloads are increasing in AP in the fourth way is that your AP staff now has to be alert for new frauds. It's not enough to just be alert for old frauds and be able to identify them and make sure that your organization doesn't fall for them, you all, they also have to be alert for new, new frauds because they are continually coming at us. And what we've seen uh, in st recent statistics, especially statistics from the Association of Financial Professionals, is that accounts payable is the primary target for a lot of these new frauds. In fact, I think the statistics showed that 61% of these new frauds were uh, directed directly at accounts payable. So they have to be alert for these new frauds, and when they become aware of them, they have to devise tactics, make sure that the organization doesn't fall for it. They have to educate everybody. They have to share this information. So it's it's another a hat, so to speak, that they wear, and it's not something that we think about. So what is the fifth uh, issue that we are all dealing with? And in some cases, it's really big. And this is the massive, I cannot emphasize this enough, massive increase in new verif verification protocols that are now required. Now, we all know about we have to verify those change of bank accounts change of bank account requests that are emailed in, but that's just the beginning of it, okay? And that takes a lot of extra work. And I know most of the time when you call up to verify, the person says, yes, we, we did send that. It's a legitimate request. But the one time that it's not a legitimate request, it can mean a lot of money going out the door if you don't catch it. They also have to verify a wire request coming from the CEO, the CFO, or somebody like that. And anything else that comes out up that's out of the ordinary, that's not the ordinary way that you do work. Whether you've gone down the road of a full-blown AP automation solution or just focused on invoice automation, a good understanding of invoices and invoice issues is critical to the success of your project. That's why we recently produced a talk focusing on the various aspects of invoice. You can watch it right now using the link that has appeared on your YouTube screen and is in the description. Good luck.